Yeah, I would say the it makes me think of the um, the learning to trust yourself thing I spoke about before. That like mm. you in the moment before you close your eyes, you know that you're not you're not walking towards the be uh, towards the ocean, and you know you're not walking towards a cliff or you know um, there's a there's a preparing yourself for that. There's a self care and a kind of um, yeah, a process of, of self love there at, at play that's that's looking out for your best interests, and to me that's that's a an important hugely important process. But it's also it's interesting what you said about the way our senses are compromised with you know the way I interpret that is our current kind of propagandized media landscape where very little is you know, in terms of sense making is it's very difficult to kind of. Uh, find reliable narratives and if you're walking along the beach and you can't see very well and then you actually you, you go and you buy glasses and you there are things we can do to improve our, our seeing to be good enough that we feel safe and I think that's the um, again in this analogy the, the goal isn't to see everything clearly the goal isn't to have a microscope and to be able to, to see the shape of every single grain of sand on the beach you don't need a perfect 100% picture of everything. You just need to know that you're broadly safe because existence isn't safe. It's not fundamentally safe. You know, like we, we will die, harm will come to, to us or people we love. And, and that's just kind of part of the game. And so you have to, we have to learn to be okay with that uncertainty and to, to, to see well enough that we, we know that we're, we can be safe. And then ultimately we spoke about the fear of death and how it can be overcome with this non-dual perspective you that's important as well because that allows you to really get into this level of non-attachment where you're like i'm going to walk along the beach with my eyes closed if it turns out there's a, a you know miraculously there's a man open manhole in front of me even though it's on a beach which is highly unlikely but if it turns out that's the case and i fall down it and that's how i died okay that's how i died like i'm gonna die at some point it's like that it just happens like you know could happen at any point so being okay with that in a in a deep way where you you're not just bypassing your, your fear of death but you're contextualizing it getting out of this egoic ruminative evolved psychology that's obsessed with our own survival um is to me is a really helpful way forward would you be able to uh speak to me around the living mirror of consciousness theory that you that you kind of developed and and mm -hmm. maybe yeah, maybe it would be nice to just explore that with you and, and see if I'm wrapping my head around it in the way that... Yeah, you know. so there's there are a few different ways you could describe it. Um, to me, maybe one way you could describe it is to say that um, what consciousness is, is not... I mentioned earlier how it's it's not separate from what we are as physical embodied living things. Um, so what you can understand it to be is an, an interfacing process. It's like an activity. It's not really, a, it's not like a substance or a material or something like that. It's a, it's not, it's a process more than the thing. It's a, um, which is why it seems to be immaterial. It doesn't seem to be like a substance. So it's a way of, of interfacing with the rest of the world. And in, when you look at, at um, when you look at our universe, life, living systems, are the kinds of things that need to do that. They're little islands of order that keep themselves together against all of the kind of destructive forces in the universe for a period of time. And to do that, you need to interface with the world around you. So, on a in a big picture level, you could say consciousness is. It's like this relational thing. You, the universe becomes living things, and then the universe knows itself through living things, through it, through interfacing with itself. Um, so that's a kind of big picture view of it. You can also flush it out, as I've done in, in the kind of academic work, in, in as like a rigorous scientific theory of like here's the biophysics um, dynamics of life. And here's why it necessarily entails a process that we model with something called Bayesian inference, where it's like uh, this relates to kind of predictive 
purchasing model of the brain where to be to be a living system you need to be predicting what's going to happen in the next moment so if i'm if i'm walking down the street and then there's a bus uh you know moving towards me and one moment it's a certain size of my retina the next moment it's bigger then bigger then bigger if i if my brain and if my if as a whole organism i interpret that as just moment by moment okay that now it's bigger now it's bigger now it's bigger I need to be predicting into the future because I'm time is always flowing. I'm I'm I need to navigate through the world. That's what it is to be a living thing. I need to predict that because it's getting bigger, it's going it's going to get even bigger, and it, that means it's getting closer to me and it's going to hit me. So to live, you need to do that process of prediction. You're all we're always we're always feeling slightly into the future to feel what happens next. Um, because the world fundamentally isn't isn't one hundred percent safe, like I said earlier. Um, so yeah, you can think of it in these different ways in a kind of technical, like how the thermodynamics of life necessitates this predictive process of of knowing the world around you, or in this more poetic, you know, life is the way the universe comes to know itself, and that process of knowing is is consciousness. Mm. So yeah, so where did, just curious in terms of. Um, the footsteps through the sand and, and the presence in each footstep and um, the non-predictive nature of that walk, I guess, um, because there's a deep presence in the mo moment of each step. Maybe there is prediction going on on some level um, in the background. Um, but I've just, yeah, that kind of comes up for me and I'm wondering how that that theory kind of informs the way that you may live your life or you may go through, you know, your steps. Yeah, it's so one on one level it makes it makes it feel I mean I'm putting the cart before the horse a bit here because I already had a certain worldview when I came to this theory, but it reifies this this worldview for me of over the universe we are an unfolding of it. Our conscious experiences of the universe knowing itself through us. Um so we're not these little isolated, lonely uh, machines that you know are irrelevant. We're we're part of this this process, and consciousness is a fundamentally natural like part of the world, kind of waking up to itself. Uh, and so I think that's a, a great vision of, of existence. And the most consequential thing I would say is that it's really made me confront issues of suffering and harm causing in the world because I you know the traditional way of thinking is don't don't hurt a cat or a dog because they're almost certainly conscious or their philosophers disagree um you know we all we all tend to think someone who like kicks a cat for no reason is not behaving wisely or, or nicely because we think the cat can suffer um people when it comes to kind of setting rat traps or something, they'll, they'll most people probably still feel like there's an issue there of like, it probably feels pain and, um, but then other people would deny it. Then you get down to insects or say fish, you know, some, a lot of people say fishing is fine because they can't feel pain, but in this picture they would, they would you know, feel pain. And you get down to kind of killing insects. And again, it gets, gets a lot more fuzzy here. It'd be interesting to know the statistics and how many people think it's an insect suffers if you, you know, spot it or something. But then you go even further and now in this picture, all of those things can suffer and single cell bacteria can as well. So if you take an antibiotic that kills, you know, uh, all these little single cell things in your, in your system, or even if you wash your hands, you're killing a lot of living things that, that will suffer in those, those moments. Uh, can you show me so, how that links with the theory, James? I'm just kind of yeah so if you could help me with that any page. the idea with the theory is that part of the problem with the main the kind of the dominant way of thinking in the neuroscience of consciousness is a focus on the brain as a kind of causal as the causal mechanism behind generating consciousness a kind of machine way of, of thinking um whereas i'm i think the correlation between brain activity and consciousness in us is actually consciousness exists as an interface in a loop between us and the environment but in us, it does run through the brain, the, this process. So there are correlations, but there are also correlations. Um, you know, I taste coffee. I tend to taste coffee when I'm drinking coffee. So there's, there's correlations with other physical things in the world as well. 
Um, so I, I'm saying brains aren't strictly necessary for consciousness. They are in us uh, for us to kind of uh, just the way we're structured. But in other living systems, they don't need a brain. What they need is to be an embodied living system. That's the relevant thing to being conscious. Now, the first form of life, the simplest form of life is a single celled organism, uh, like an amoeba, like a bacteria, a bacterium. And they evolved to multicellular things that have operate by the same principles. But I'm saying if, it, if life is the important thing, then, then feeling should exist in single celled organisms as well, in bacteria. So when, I mean, when you wash your hands, you're, or say you put you know, antibacterial gel on your hands as we've all been doing with COVID, the idea is to create an environment that's inhospitable for life. And so anything living, living cells, living um, single celled organisms on your hands will find themselves in a, an environment they need to escape from. And the feeling of negativity, pain, suffering is, is the drive to escape. So if, if the room I'm in suddenly caught on fire, I would feel that to be negative because, and that feeling is synonymous with me trying to escape um, from it. And if something feels nice, it's a signal to kind of stay with it. And, you know, if eating feels good because it's synonymous with something we want to be, want to be doing um, generally. So in this picture, there's, there's a lot of suffering going on and suffering is a kind of an inherent part of existence for, for living things. Um, and that's quite a thing. If you think that's true, that's quite a thing to reckon with. And even if you, I mean, if you take the hand washing thing, at first when I thought that, I thought that doesn't seem plausible because that's so much suffering we're causing. <clears throat> maybe suffering is not the right word. Maybe I should say pain or negativity or um, I would say negatively valenced experience would be the technical way to say it. Um, but then actually, if you think about the vast majority of human history, we weren't washing our hands. We didn't have the, we didn't have the chemicals to do that. So it makes sense that these living things would live on our hands. And but now we've come up with a way to kind of exterminate them um, in this routine way. And so even if you think this, if, you, if, you, if you're not willing to accept that this is plausible, for me at least, it started to open my eyes to to the way how existing negatively causes harm to other things. So, you know, I'm broadly vegetarian in my diet, but then I started thinking about, well, you know, I, I have a, a farm in Portugal where I am now, where I'm building a retreat center and we had to till the ground. And then after that, I was thinking, well, how many, you know, are there moles in the ground whose nests have been disturbed? Are there insects that got killed in, the, in that process? Um, and they think, well, if I'm buying vegetables from a supermarket, how many animals are, are being harmed in, in that process? And yet mm. most vegetarians who are doing it for ethical reasons like to think, okay, I've done it. I've extracted myself from the harming of animals in my food production. But then it, it was because of my theory, I suddenly was like, wait a minute, that's an illusion. That's not, I mean, it's still an improvement on directly, you know, factory farming, but like, so there's, it, it allowed me, it's allowed me to confront the complexity here ethically and to feel that to exist as a living thing is to cause to cause harm inevitably but that the wise way forward is to learn to be emotionally grounded and at peace enough to, to be okay with that in a way where you can you can know that you're trying to navigate the world as best as you can um so one the pathological thing to do would be to go screw it I, I no longer care about human suffering because there's so much suffering happening all the time anyway and i no longer i'm just going to eat from factory farmed animals because they're you know I'm, I'm now desensitized to because i think there's so much suffering in the in the world um that would be a way of of creating a block or like trying to suppress the negative feelings by just kind of dismissing them um for me the ultimate way forward or the end point with with living a good life is to live in a state of of staying with one's anxieties with one's challenges and difficulties in a way where you can integrate them and you can stay with them um that process to me is what it is to be a person is is to we we, we don't find ourselves in a utopia or a hell we find ourselves in this mixed middle ground and so we just have to navigate our way through it and use our feelings to, to navigate. So I would say existence is a navigation problem and that's fine. 
most of us, or a lot of people, especially when emotional stress gets too high, they want nice and neat solutions. They want to say, I, you know, I can live this lifestyle and I can call myself a, a perfectly ethical person. And then if you bring up how the, the you know, the minerals and the microchips were, were got through slave labor and mines in Africa and stuff like that, they don't want to hear it. And so that's not a white, that's a neurotics, you know, disconnected way of being in my, in my view. And it's, it's a challenge, but, but I think people feel like if they're, sometimes they feel like if they're, the, that living with ambiguity is not a satisfactory endpoint, they want certainty. But again, that typically comes from when there's, why would, why would you need certainty? Why would you need to aggressively reify beliefs and to hold on to them strongly? Usually because you you feel unsafe or you've faced challenges. Um, and I mean, this is, this is ultimately what leads to extremism in politics as well, when it comes to things like fascism, where people just want nice, simple narratives where they can say that outgroup is to blame, project all of the problems on that outgroup. And if we persecute them, then we'll feel like we're in, we're, we're moving into a positive place because we, we've just consolidated all of our anxieties into one place and we're dealing with it. And that's a kind of delusional, danger, highly dangerous um, way to be. And so what I'm advocating is the inverse of that, is a state of, instead of coming up with quick fixes that are delusional, you stay with the open um, uncertainty of being, which is just the, the state we find ourselves in.